Hello everyone, welcome back to the course Expansive Soil. Today we will learn about some of the applications of Expansive Soil, particularly application of Expansive Soil for various geotechnical engineering application. This will be the lecture number 24th and the last lecture of this course and it will be in module 8. So far we have learned that Expansive Soil is a problematic soil. The problem associated with any Expansive Soil is lies because of its swelling characteristics, shrinkage and uneven settlement or swelling. When an expansive soil absorbs moisture, the water content of the soil will increase and that will lead to the swelling of the soil. Similarly, when the water content reduces because of the evaporation or evapotranspiration, the volume of, the, volume of an expansive soil will decrease and that will lead to the shrinkage of the soil. When the swelling and shrinkage takes place, there will be heaving and settlement of a structure. And if this heaving at or settlement of the structure becomes non-uniform or uneven, then that will lead to a damage to a structure. So therefore, the different problems associated with an expansive soils are swelling, shrinkage, uneven settlement and swelling. And, uh, we know that 17 percent of Indian land mass is occupied by expansive soil and the damage caused due to the expansive soil is quite large. In an estimate that total amount of damage caused because of expansive soil is far more than the total damage caused due to earthquake, tsunami, flood or hurricane combined together. So therefore, we can know that how big the problem is. Here we can see an example. In this case, a structure is resting on an expansive soil. So, this is an one expansive soil and there are cracks or fissures pre present over here and these are known as the desiccation cracks. When there is a rainfall occurs or when this cracks comes in contact with water, the volume of this soil will increase or when the water comes in contact with these cracks, the water can migrate into the expansive soil the water will increase into the expansive soil which is present below the foundation. In this case, during the monsoon season or rainy season, the water will penetrate to the expansive soil and because of this penetration of the water into the expansive soil, the volume of this soil will increase. We have also learned before that the ingress of the water is not uniform below a foundation. Due to the presence of slab or other structures, there will be non-uniform ingress of water to the soil and as the water ingress is non-uniform, the swelling behavior of the soil below this foundation will also be not uniform. In this case, we can see here a large amount of water has been ingressed at this portion whereas less amount of water has been ingressed to this portion and because of less amount of water over here, the swelling will be less at this point. However, due to large amount of water ingress at this point, the swelling will be high at this point. And because of this uneven swelling, the structure will be lifted unevenly. In this diagram, a large amount of heaving has been occurring at this point in comparison to this. So, due to this uneven heaving or uneven swelling of the soil, the structure will get damaged. The crack will start to appear on the structure and that will damage the structure. Similarly, during the drying season, the reverse thing happens. That means, the water will be removed from the soil because of the process of evaporation or evapotranspiration. Again, the removal of the water will not, will not be uniform. And because of this non-uniform removal of water, again, the shrinkage of the soil will be different. In this case here, the amount of removal of the water is less in comparison to here. So, as the less amount of water has been removed here, the amount of shrinkage on this portion will be less in comparison to this portion. And here in this structure, we could see an uneven shrinkage has occurred and because of that, this portion has been tilted and due to this uneven settlement or uneven shrinkage, again cracks will start to appear on the structure and this process takes place regularly. That means, there will be cyclic swelling and shrinkage behavior. So, in 
rainy season there will be expansion of the soil and during the dry season there will be shrinkage of the soil and due to this uneven swelling and shrinkage taking place regularly the structure will get damaged or collapsed so here you can see this is a seasonal wetting in the seasonal wetting the swelling of the soil will take place unevenly and that will lead to uneven heaving of the structure similarly due to the seasonal drying there will be shrinkage of the structure and the shrinkage will be more at the center point in this diagram and in, in this diagram the swelling will be more at corner so therefore the swelling shrinkage will give non uniform settlement or non uniform swelling to the structure and if the process is repeated for a quite long time or quite large number of times then the structure will get damaged in this pictures we could see some of the damaged structure the cracks has appeared on this buildings uh, from the corner all those pictures has been taken from the internet and again the columns there is a large cracks appeared in this column similarly if we look into the highway here we can find wavy surface because of the uneven swelling and shrinkage and also large amount of cracks has appeared on the surface so these are the total the different types of damage which we can expect in the field due to the expansive soil so therefore expansive soil can be treated as a problematic soil but we have to remember that expansive soil also possesses some of the good characteristics so these are the different properties of expansive soil which uh, differentiate it from the other soils one is the swelling the second one is low hydraulic conductivity and the third one is the contaminant adsorption capacity the swelling means the volume of the soil will increase due to the absorption of moisture and it will give a lower value of hydraulic conductivity in comparison to all other soils and it has a tendency to adsorb contaminant due to presence of negative charge on its surface so this three characteristics of an expansive soil particularly bentonite distinguish it from the other soil therefore bentonite can also be applied for different engineering application due to this three characteristics so we will learn about all those uh, applications particularly in the area of geotechnical engineering the first application is ap application of expansive soil at landfill this is particularly related with the geo environmental engineering so going by the definition of geo environmental engineering geo environmental engineering is an interdisciplinary subjects which uh, studies the effect of environment on the geotechnical behavior of the soil so for example this is our earth we have atmosphere where we have air we have biosphere where we have plant animals we have lithosphere where we have soil and we have hydrosphere where we have water so if there is a contamination or pollution takes place to one of this sphere then that will also contaminate the other sphere say for example in this case if air is getting polluted then the pollutant can come back to the earth surface with the rain water and this pollutant can increase into the soil along with the rain water and then it can migrate into the ground water source when we take this ground water for our drinking purpose or day to day life use then it will affect our health similarly the plant or other animal when they intake this water polluted water then they will get affected therefore the effect to any of this sphere can also affect the other sphere say like affecting the atmosphere can causes a problem to biosphere lithosphere and hydrosphere so geo environmental engineering deals with the effect of environmental factors on particularly the lithosphere or the soil because of its low value of hydraulic conductivity high swelling characteristics and contaminant adsorption capacity expansive soil can be used for a landfill application before that we would like to know what is the meaning of landfill so you might have seen uh, this thing around your city so these are the waste which we used to dump so these are the different kind of waste mostly this is a municipal solid waste which we generate 
from our home or any residential building or any restaurant. So, this waste generally are dumped into a landfill and this waste mostly contains the organic matter and with time thus this organic matter gets disintegrate and they produce leachate. Here you can see these are the leachates. So, here we can see the leachates which are produced over here. So, leachate is very harmful toxic chemicals and it uh, contains a large number of different type of contaminant which is not good for health. And also this leachates has high BOD, COD and also toxic chemicals. So, when this leachates migrates through the soil and joins or contaminate the ground water resource, then if we intake those contaminated water, then that will impact our health. So, therefore, we need to prevent the migration of this leachate through the soil and joining the water table. So, that is the purpose of a landfill. Generally, a landfill is provided to reduce the effect of leachates on groundwater. This is a diagram of a landfill. These are the waste which are dumped in a landfill. These are the waste material. So, this waste can be municipal solid waste or can be industrial waste or hazardous waste. Now, this waste will produce leachate and this leachate can migrate through the soil and can contaminate the groundwater resource. Now, in order to prevent this leachate to migrate into the groundwater, we provide a barrier layer in between the waste and the groundwater. This barrier layer is known as clay liner. The main objective of this clay liner is to prevent the migration of this contaminant through it and thereby not affecting the groundwater resource. So, therefore, the clay liner should have a lower value of hydraulic conductivity. And as the contaminant are present in the leachate, the liner material should have a tendency to adsorb the contaminant. And as we know earlier that bentonite possess both these characteristics. That means, it has a lower value of hydraulic conductivity and also it can absorb large amount of contaminant. Therefore, bentonite is used as a liner material in the landfill site and bentonite is an expansive soil. Here, we need to provide a layer of bentonite which will act as a liner material So, bentonite will act as a liner material and it will be like acting as a impermeable or barrier material between the waste and the water. Now, if we look into the different uh, guideline given by the different uh, organization for a landfill liner material, we can see there are several layers of impermeable soils are there. All has a different function on over here. But if we look into all this layer, then we will find a compacted layer of clay is present here. This layer is act as a liner material or a barrier material. So, main purpose of this material is to provide an impermeable layer between the waste and the water and generally this clay is bentonite and this is for a surface liner system. Here again we need to remember that the rain water should not migrate into this waste. Therefore, at the top also we need to provide a barrier layer. So, this is known as the capping system or cap layer and this is known as the bottom liner. On the surface liner or the cap liner, here also we need to provide an impermeable layer of soil. So, again the purpose of this impermeable layer to provide a lower value of hydraulic conductivity to this capping system such that water will not migrate into the waste. So, this clay here can be replaced by an expansive soil or an expansive soil 
can be used as a impermeable layer for a liner system. Similarly, if we look into the other design criteria given by other environmental agency, we could see again somewhere it is given like a layer of a clay liner in the form of a compacted clay liner and geosynthetic clay liner. We learned in the previous classes that geosynthetic clay liner consisting of layers of two geotextile and in between them a layer of expansive soil is present. So, this is, this is a GCL or geosynthetic clay liner. So, a, here we can also replace this one with a geosynthetic clay liner and presence of bentonite will provide a lower hydraulic conductivity to the GCL. So, therefore, whether we go for a compacted clay liner or we go for a GCL, bentonite or an expansive soil occupy the most important position in this lining system. So, the first application of this expansive soil will be the liner application. Here we could see a geosynthetic clay liner, this is a geotextile. and this is bentonite which will be sandwiched between two layers of geotextile and this is the construction of a liner here you can see the compacted clay liner and also the GCL. If you look into the construction of a landfill liner here we can see layers of compacted sand bentonite this is bentonite is being mixed with sand and after the compaction they are covered with a sheet so that the evaporation of the water will not take place now here we need to remember one another thing is Generally, bentonite is not used alone. Bentonite has to be used along with sand. Mostly around 10 to 20 percent of the bentonite is used with sand. And bentonite is used with sand so that the hydraulic conductivity will decrease. The compaction characteristics of the bentonite we know is very less. So, by adding sand, the compaction characteristic of sand bentonite mixture will also increase and also by adding sand to bentonite that will also reduce its shrinkage characteristics or it will reduce the desiccation shrinkage of the bentonite. So, next the use of expansive soil at a nuclear waste repository. This is one of the another major use of an expansive soil particularly bentonite at a nuclear waste repository site. We know that radioactive nuclear materials are used for production of electricity. Once the the material is used up then we just cannot throw that in a landfill because this radioactive material will be emitting some radiation therefore it has to be buried hundreds of meters below the ground surface mostly in a rocky area. So, this is an example of an underground nuclear waste repository site here we can see this is the access tunnel and th here the nuclear waste materials are buried and this is generally located at a depth ranging from 300 to 1000 meter below the ground surface. These are the underground facility and this will mostly cover with a bedrock. And these are the access tunnel. If we enlarge this portion, we can see here, this is the access tunnel. This is the canister containing high level nuclear waste and this is a layer of compacted bentonite. Now, here bentonite is provided as a buffer material and when we talk about this paint fuel, generally this paint fuel has 95 percent of uranium dioxide, 3 to 4 percent of fission product and around 1 percent of plutonium or other actinides and these are located at a depth of 300 to 1000 meter below the ground surface. Because of this uh, problem associated with the spent fuel, it has to be buried under the ground. Now, if we look into this the cross sectional view of this underground facility, we have the access tunnel, this is the canister and there will be some space over here and these are the bentonite compacted at a high density. We need to remember that the water which are present here should not react with this canister. 
generally this canister is made of either steel or copper. So, if the water react with this canister, then the corrosion may occur and that may release the radioactive waste to the outside. Therefore, bentonite is provided to act as an impermeable layer between the canister and the ground water or the rock. So, this is the cross section of a repository site. Bentonite can be used uh, in the three form. One is a fill form which uh, containing sand bentonite mixture in a ratio of 80 to 20 in this part and a fill of compacted sand bentonite mixture in a ratio of 90 is to 10. Then these are the different blocks of bentonite which are compacted to a very high density mostly around 1.8 to 2.0 gram per cc to provide a very low value of hydraulic conductivity. This is the canister with spent fuel and generally a gap of 50 mm is provided between the bedrock and this layer. So, this is around 50 mm. Then it will be filled with the powder bentonite and there will be a gap of approximately 10 mm will be there between the canister and this block and when there is a water ingress this can fill this void. And when you use the bentonite as a buffer material then it should have certain characteristics like the hydraulic conductivity should be less than 10 to the power of minus 12 meter per second. And also the material which is used for the buffer should have a swelling pressure which should be very high and it should not be more than 20 MPa to avoid any excessive pressure on this canister. And also it has should have a very high thermal conductivity should be more than 1.0 watt per meter per degree Kelvin to dissipate heat from the canister. Since this canister will be consisting of spent nuclear fuel, this uh, radioactive material will be emitting heat and uh, with time it will get heated. So, therefore, this buffer material should be able to release this heat without any problem. And also the organic content present in this uh, buffer material should be less than 0.5 percent. Here we need to remember one thing that the migration of this radionuclides can take place in two way. One is known as uh, diffusion and another one is known as advection. If the hydraulic conductivity is less than 10 to the power minus 8 meter per second, then the migration will be in the form of diffusion. which will be better in comparison to if it is happening through advection. Therefore, this buffer material should have a hydraulic conductivity which should be less than 10 to the power of minus 8 meter per second. Therefore, here a design value of 10 to the power minus 12 meter per second has been taken such that the migration of the radionuclides can take place only through the diffusion not through the advection. Similarly, as we have seen earlier. This is surrounded by bedrock and the water can also ingress through the bedrock and generally this um, bedrock which is mostly of granite has a hydraulic conductivity ranging around 10 to the power minus 8 to 10 to the power minus 10 meter per second. Now if the hydraulic conductivity of this buffer material is less than this value then the water will bypass through this um, buffer material and it will not come in contact with the buffer or it will not try to ingress into the buffer and it will bypass through the buffer material. So, therefore, the hydraulic conductivity of buffer should be less than this value. So, finally, a hydraulic conductivity of 10 to the power minus 12 meter per second or less has been proposed as a buffer material. Now, when we provide bentonite as a buffer material because bentonite has certain characteristics like it has a high tendency to solve cationic radionuclides, it has a high swelling capacity thereby sealing any cracks or voids present here. It provides a very low hydraulic conductivity and also it provides a long term stability under high radiation. So, because of all these properties of the bentonite, bentonite is used as a buffer material at a nuclear waste repository site and bentonite generally compacted at a density of around 1.8 to 2 gram per cc and at a water content of around 4 to 6 percent and generally these are 
compacted in the form of a blocks and then they are placed here. Bentonite or an expansive soil can also act as a containment system as a cutoff wall or a barrier wall. Suppose there is a storage tank which contains some oil or some organic contaminant and suppose there is a leakage occurs and due to this leakage the contaminant will migrate through the soil and then they will join the groundwater. Now we know that organic contaminants are mostly two types. One is N napple and another is D napple. Generally L napple is very light, lighter than water, so it will float on the water surface. And D napple is dense napple and it will be heavier than water, so it will shrink. Now depending on the type of organic contaminant, either it will float or sink. But when it comes in contact with the water, it will try to move from one point to another point or it will try to migrate because of the flow of water. Now in this case, we need to provide a slurry wall or known as cutoff wall or barrier wall such that the contaminant will not be able to migrate from one point to another point. Thereby, the area of contaminant all will be limited only to this portion. So, this can be achieved by providing a vertical barrier wall or a slurry wall which will be digged into the ground and because of the lower value of hydraulic conductivity of bentonite, it will be used as a slurry wall. In this case, we, we could see this slurry wall is not going into the bedrock, it is only floating above the bedrock. Because in this case, the contaminant is lighter than water, so it will float and this slurry wall will prevent the movement of this contaminant from going this point onwards. Now using an extraction well, this contaminant can be removed. So this barrier wall or slurry wall will be provided to prevent the further migration of the contaminant from the point of leakage to a large area. So going by the definition, the cutoff wall is a device used to reduce or prevent the seepage of water or prevent the migration of the contaminant from one point to another point, thereby reducing the area which is exposed to this contaminant. This can be either a floating type or it can be a keyed in type. In this case, we could see this slurry wall is going deep into the bedrock because in this case, the contaminant which is present is D napple. That means it will be denser than water. So the contaminant will not come to the surface and if it is not a keyed in, then the contaminant can migrate through the gap between the bedrock and this slurry wall. Therefore, this slurry wall has to be keyed in into impermeable bedrock such that this contaminant cannot move further. And again, this will be extracted using an extraction well. Similarly, the vertical barrier wall can also be provided all around a waste in order to contain it from moving further. This is a waste material which is present here. This is a water table and if we do not provide this barrier wall, then water will come in contact with this waste. Therefore, we need to provide a vertical wall in this form as well as a bottom wall like this such that the contaminant will be arrested within this zone and the water table will not come in contact with this waste. Therefore, the water will not get polluted. Bentonite can be used to prepare this slurry wall or vertical wall. The bentonite can also be used as a compacted clay barrier wall all around the waste such that it cannot migrate. This compacted clay barrier can be used for a shallow depth and mostly a mixture of sand bentonite is used as a compacted clay barrier. The bentonite can also be used as a slurry trench barrier and also this is known as cut up wall or slurry wall. And this is most commonly used as a vertical barrier wall for waste containment at hazardous waste site. This is an example of a slurry wall. So in this case what happens is wall has to be provided which will be made of this slurry. So in this case these are the different excavation sequence. First a narrow trench 
or a vertical trench of width 2 to 4 feet will be made and if the soil here is weak soil then once we made this trench then the soil may cave in. So, in order to prevent or to stabilize this soil we need to fill this one with a slurry. The main function of this slurry is to stabilize the wall so that it will be not cave in. When we provide a slurry mostly a mixture of bentonite and water then it will exert a hydrostatic pressure and due to this hydrostatic pressure this will balance the lateral earth pressure coming from the side and therefore it will prevent the falling or caving in of this wall. And when we provide bentonite slurry then the bentonite slurry will also migrate into the nearby soil. Here we can see the migration of the bentonite slurry is taking place over here. As the bentonite slurry migrate into the nearby soil, it will provide a low permeable area all around it. So, this is known as a filter cake. This filter cake will be of low permeability soil and this filter cake will prevent the slurry loss that means because of its low hydraulic conductivity the slurry will not migrate into this area therefore the slurry will stay in here. So this is the filter cake and once this is done then it will be filled with the slurry mixture. So this is the slurry trench barrier. So going by the excavation sequence first a trench will be made which will be of 2 to 4 feet wide and then to stabilize the slurry to stabilize the side wall from collapsing we need to add slurry which will be a bentonite suspension and that slurry will provide a stabilization to the soil or will resist the lateral earth pressure coming from the soil thereby preventing the collapsing of the side wall. And also this slurry wall or the bentonite slurry will migrate into the nearby soil and thereby providing a impermeable layer around it. Therefore, slurry will not further move to the soil and thus it will prevent a slurry loss to the soil. So, in this case a bentonite suspension can be used as a slurry barrier wall. Now the selection of this material, the slurry material, the bentonite water mostly used or a mixture of bentonite, cement and water should be used and the slurry should have a density of 1025 kg per meter cube. So this minimum density is required so that the slurry can be flushed out from this trench. And the vac filling material which will be used should be able to displace the slurry and the unit weight of the backfill should be more than 240 kg per meter cube than the slurry material such that when you pour this um, backfilling material over this slurry material, the slurry material can be flushed out from the trench. Now there is another application of bentonite that will be as a drilling fluid. During the drilling operation particularly in the case of a weak soil, the side wall can caved in or there will be collapse of the side wall. Say for example, when we go for a drilling or piling operation, first we need to dig a hole and then we need to put the reinforcement over here. So when we dig the bore hole, then if the bore hole is made of weak material, then because of the earth pressure here, the soil may cave in and that will provide a difficulty in the piling. So therefore, in this case we use a bentonite slurry to prevent the collapse of the side wall and this collapse of the side wall depends on the density of the soil, the cohesiveness of the soil, the pore water pressure and vibration. All these factors can control or can affect the collapsing of this soil. And when we add a bentonite slurry, the main purpose of this bentonite slurry is to prevent the side wall from getting collapsed. 
So therefore, a drilling fluid in the form of bentonite slurry is provided and this bentonite slurry should satisfy the following criteria. That means, it must support the excavation by exerting the hydrostatic pressure on the side wall. It must remain in the borehole and should not flow into the well. It must not have significant interference between the bond between the reinforcement of pile and concrete. It must be replaced easily and it should be easy to pump. So, this should be the role of drilling fluid. That means, when we provide a bentonite slurry or drilling fluid into a borehole, then it should apply a hydrostatic pressure. So, this hydrostatic pressure should be sufficient enough to counter react the earth pressure of the soil around this wall such that the wall will not cave in. So, this is the primary function. Similarly, the slurry material should stay within this hole. It should not move or it should not penetrate to the side wall. Therefore, it, there should not be any slurry loss during the entire process until the reinforcement has been put into the drill. Once the construction is over, then it can be replaced quite easily such that this slurry material can be reused again. And also this slurry material should be easy to pump in so that it can the hole can be filled. Here you can see this is a drill hole where the reinforcement or piling should will be carried out. And before the piling will be carried out or before the inserting this uh, reinforcement, this will be filled with the slurry material. Now when we use a drilling fluid, it should have certain requirement like the liquid limit should be more than 400 percent, the viscosity should be 30 to 60 stroke, the slurry density should be 1.03 to 1.1 gram per cc, the PS should be 9 to 11.5. So, this is as far as Indian standard 2911. Now, this liquid limit is given such that the slurry should have a sufficient swelling behavior. That means, uh, when we add water to bentonite, it should have a sufficient swelling tendency so, so that it can exert a pressure over here and the viscosity should be 30 to 60 and the slurry density we need to maintain between this to this. A lower value of slurry density is given such that the slurry can be displaced and a higher value of density is given such that it will exert a pressure on the side wall. We know that with increase in the density the uh, hydrostatic pressure will increase. So, therefore, a higher value of density is preferred. But if we increase the density to a large extent, then while removing this slurry or this drilling fluid, it will be difficult. Therefore, we have to have a some minimum value of the density. That means, it should be 1.03 so that it can be replaced or it can be flushed out quite easily and it should have higher value of density such that it will exert a hydrostatic pressure to counter react this earth pressure from the side wall. So, therefore, the density should be in the range between 1.03 to 1.1 gram per cc. And here bentonite is used because of its thixotropic behavior. In the thixotropic behavior, the bentonite will gain its strength with time. So, therefore, when we put this slurry material with time, the bentonite will gain its shear strength and therefore, it will give an effective counterbalance to the side wall earth pressure. And also, when we agitate this bentonite slurry mixture, then again it will co come back to its fluid form. So, therefore, all this reason the bentonite is used along with the water for a slurry fluid and generally bentonite in the proportion of 6 to 8 percent by weight is mixed with the water to prepare a drilling fluid for a piling operation. Apart from this uh, geotechnical application, some clay soil like um, kaolinite or elite can also be used for other applications. Say for example, kaolinite can also be used as an insulator for using at transmission line
and also kaolinate can also be used as a porcelain to prepare different kind of pottery and sometimes the bentonite is used as a to manufacture some of the medicine. So, these are the various engineering particularly geotechnical application of expansive soil particularly bentonite. These are the few references or bibliography which has been used for this lecture. Thank you.